on top. I think there is this button for no, recording. Pretty full. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so we we'll give you an introduction to to smart contract. We are almost there. Okay. Yes. So I give you an introduction to smart contract. And I will start with a general overview of what is a smart contract. And because up to now, what Tal told you about is really like the base layer of the blockchain, like the consensus agreement, like how do we agree on which transactions are on the blockchain and like what is a transaction maybe, but really, really like the base, base layer and smart contract is like kind of the next layer of a blockchain, of a modern blockchain. And uh, after that, we'll do a deep dive in the Algorand smart contract. We'll do also a quick comparison with Ethereum so that like, you are not lost. Like there are sim many similarities, a few differences. So it's good that, to know like what, what they are. And after that, we'll show if we have time um, how to use, uh, how to create a DAP, like a decentralized application, like, and how to use wallets for that something like this. And we will conclude with some advanced topics that are more specific to Algorand, but are generally interesting. Okay, so let's start with smart contracts. Oh, what I forgot to say, I think Asta, like if you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt, like if something is not clear. Uh, they don't hesitate, okay, uh, that's good. Uh, okay, so what is a smart contract? So essentially a smart contract is some piece of code that lives on the blockchain. So you send, like you make it live in the blockchain, you deploy it to the blockchain and it lives in the blockchain. And really uh, the idea is that a smart contract can interact with all the data on chain and you can from outside of the blockchain interact with the smart contract. So that's all this is that at the end of it, the smart contract is really just a small program on the blockchain. So example of smart contract you may have heard. So I'm pretty sure you have all heard about uh, DeFi, like this is the new um, thing around decentralized finance. So if you do normal finance, like you usually have like a central trusted authority, like a bank or something like this, that will handle everything. It will and uh, manage the full financial services. Either, for example, you would have an exchange place like um, New York Stock Exchange, just downtown. Oh, oh, oops, we are not in New York City, but uh, anyway, New York, uh, not, far, not far away by train and thing like this, but it's really centralized place. So DeFi, DeFi is essentially a decentralized version of finance where there's no more a central authority, but the blockchain at some level is managing uh, the financial instrument. So you can have like exchanges to be able to exchange currencies like Euro from dollar, uh, lending to be able to automatically lend money to people and things like this. You can also do things like crowdfunding. Like um, if you have a project and you want people on the internet to give money for your project, crowdfunding. <coughs> Voting, that will be your homework. So, we're, okay, I don't know where the laser is, but anyway, voting will be your homework. So you will know a lot about it. You can do decentralized name services like in uh, currently, like if, if you go to google.com, there is a central authority that says google.com belongs to Google. And this is the address of Google. So this is again, completely centralized. There is one authority would decide everything. With decentralized name service, there is no more such a central authority, the blockchain does. You can do lotteries with a star because there is some additional requirements. Okay. So here is, uh, let's start with what can a smart contract do? So the first thing that the smart contract do is really read and write data or what you call states on the blockchain. So for example, a smart contract can write votes that have been done or tally of votes. It can write on the blockchain ownership of an asset tal on this car or property of an asset. This car costs $5 or like an exchange right, a DeFi exchange right in a DeFi application. Like this is the right between these two tokens, these two currencies. A smart contract can also receive token from other contracts. Like if you think about the crowdfunding uh, smart contract, you have a project, you want people to give you money for this project. The smart contract needs to receive this money, this token. 
And obviously, I didn't need to receive it, you also need to send it away. Like it does, does not just like, keep it for itself, it needs to be able to send the token to other accounts on the blockchain. And more generally, a smart contract should also be able to interact with other smart contracts, like reading them or like taking action over them. This is slightly more advanced and actually you won't need it at all in this class, but just you need to know that it's possible. But before we go further, I want to insist on something. What are the limitations of smart contract? Like what a smart contract cannot do? And if you read the press or the news, you will hear a lot of things. Like smart contract can do everything. Blockchain can solve all the problems on earth. And it's not true. Like blo blockchain is an amazing technology. It can solve uh, like something that we did not know to solve before, like consensus, something like this, but it cannot do, uh, it cannot really interact with the outside world by itself. Like a smart contract lives on the blockchain. It has access to the data on the blockchain, but it does not have access to the real world data. It does not have access to the weather. It does not have access to the price on a stock exchange because these data are outside of the blockchain. And um, if you think about it, there is one uh, use case of smart contracts that comes very often, at least I heard it a lot, I'm sure you heard it too, is the notion of insurance smart contract that automatically would reimburse users that like got hit by a storm. That looked like amazing. The small issue is that I don't know how you can do that. The smart contract cannot know that there was a storm. It lives on the blockchain, it cannot access it information, certain information. It cannot know how much damage you have to your house. Like your house, there is not even, this information of the amount of damage on your house is not even on the internet. Like the fact that you lost the roof of your house, for example. So it's not even on the internet or how on earth can a smart contract access it? So does that mean that it's impossible to, or it's meaningless to do an insurance smart contract? It means that there are a lot of caveats. So it can be used, for example, for transparency, where the insurance company would manually input information about your house and the storm in the smart contract and the smart contract may automatically take action according to that. So there is still this manual input of the insurance company. You need to trust them. So it adds transparency because everybody can see the insurance company appropriately input the fact that there is a storm and that this house and this house have been hit by the storm. But it does not like make it automatic. It's not like there is a storm and automatically a smart contract by magic pay you the damage to your house. And the second caveat is that there is a huge area of work uh, nowadays which, that try to actually bring data from the outside world to the blockchain. And this, um, this is usually called Oracle. And Oracle is a way to bring some outside world data like the weather and things like this on the blockchain. Oracle are very complex. It's not like something directly inside the blockchain. It comes from the outside. There is a need for some, some additional trust. So, and it's still really uh, an open area of research. And um, a particular case of Oracle is if you want to interact between two blockchains. Like if you're on the Algorand blockchain, the Algorand blockchain does not know anything about the Ethereum blockchain, for example. The Ethereum blockchain does not know anything about the Bitcoin blockchain. Those are completely independent. So you can have like Oracle, specific Oracle that we call bridge, that are able to bridge this data and so that uh, this blockchain so that the Ethereum blockchain knows that certain transactions happen on the Bitcoin blockchain, for example. Oops. Okay, two other things that a smart contract cannot do. Can, uh, one thing is that the smart contract cannot work on any secret information. Everything on the blockchain is completely public. There is no secrecy whatsoever on blockchain. Everything you do when you call a smart contract, what the smart contract does, like everything the program, the smart contract does is public. And one thing that I also heard a lot and that I'm very uh, curious about how people want to do it is to use smart contracts to store medical data. Medical data is like among the most sensitive data on, on earth, like you absolutely don't want them to be leaked. Why would you want to put it on a blockchain, which is the opposite of a uh, secret, everything is public. So again, a caveat is that there is technology that actually Carl and I and many others are developing that may allow in the future to be able to store such sensitive data in a meaningful way. And I think Carl might be talking about this technology later in the class, but it's really not something that is ready now. 
And to be honest, I, I really don't know how people want to store medical data on the blockchain right now. I don't think it's possible in a meaningful way. And another caveat is that there are things that you can do secretly right now on the blockchain. It's not storing medical data and do magically on it. It's doing private transaction. Like if you want to privately send money to someone and so that nobody knows the amount you sent and who was the recipient, this is something that you can do in certain cases using like very advanced technology that also Tal will be talking later, like so very advanced crypto called ZK Smart. Um, last thing that the smart contract cannot directly do is access to randomness. Again, everything is public, everything is deterministic. So this is the opposite of randomness. If you know everything, if you know the state of the world right now, nothing is random. That means there is no quantum mechanism. So that's the issue with the blockchain. Nothing is random in the blockchain at some level. It does not mean that you cannot access randomness at all. It means that to access randomness, you need something outside of the smart contract. So there are things called randomness oracle, which are such a way to access randomness. And here, okay, so Tal did not fully talk about it, but uh, she will talk, be talking in the next class. You will see that there are things that provide some form of randomness on some blockchain, in particular on the Algorand blockchain called VRF. These things are called VRF and that provide some form of randomness, but this randomness is sufficient for consensus. It's not sufficient for real randomness for lottery. There, there are like some very subtle differences there. Okay. Enough about what smart contract can and cannot do. Let's see how we can interact with the smart contract. So let's suppose that I wrote a smart contract. How do I do anything with it? So I need to deploy it and then to the blockchain, like move it to the blockchain, like and interact with it. And remember that everything on the blockchain is a transaction. Like when Tal told you about blocks, blocks contain transactions. That's the only things they are in the block. Like I mean, to simplify, it, simplifying it a little bit there, but but everything on the blockchain is a transaction. So the same way that to send money to someone else, to send a Bitcoin to someone else, you do a transaction, to interact with a smart contract and deploy a smart contract, you make a transaction. That's the case for all the blockchain. So that's how you interact with a smart contract. Okay. So let's now see a little bit in more detail how we do our algorand, uh, how you do algorand smart contract, which will be what you need to do in your homework in two weeks, I think. Two weeks, one week. I mean, no, let's not commit. Okay. So one of your future homework. <laughs> yeah. So, so here it is. So I first want to um, introduce like some uh, terminology and first recall the notion of account. So you, in your first homework, what you were asked to create is two accounts, A and B. And then you get some algos on them and you created asset from them. You transferred uh, algos between them, algos being the token on the algo on blockchain. So this, what you created is really basic account. And if you remember, the account had essentially two parts. You had like a public key or an account address, which is a thing on the red on the right. It looked like this. And this was public and you could give it to everyone. And that essentially like define what the account is, like the account is defined by this address. And you had a secret key, like which took the shape of like 25 words, uh, 25 word name on it. And this secret key was a sign signature secret key. And that's the one that you use to authorize transactions. So to authorize any movement of token outside of your account, to authorize any transaction from your account, you would write a transaction and sign it using this mnemonic, right? So, and intuitively what the account does is that it's, the account on the blockchain, what it does, it really holds the token that you have and the state of smart contract, we'll see that later. And you can, an account allow you to issue transaction either to transfer token or to make uh, to interact with a smart contract, to call a smart contract, to deploy a smart contract, to update a smart contract, and so on. So that's an account. Now, there is, now we need a new uh, item, a new object. We need to define a new object, which is an object smart contract. Well, so a smart contract, as we have seen, is a program living on the blockchain. 
It's completely independent of an account on Algorand. It's a completely different piece. An account is defined by public key secret key. A smart contract is defined by some code and some application ID, which is the identifier of the smart contract. And account can send transaction to interact with such a smart contract. So two important, completely distinct notions. So if you have seen the block explorer, I think that in your homework, you must have used it to check that you did your homework correctly. An account, uh, a block on the block explorer, an account looks like this. Like on the top, you have the address, then you have the balances. So here, remember that on your homework, you, you could create additional token. You created your own token, so which is called an AC on Algorand. And so here, this account has two tokens, owns two tokens, Algos and USDC. And then an account, is, can make a list of transactions. And here you can see many transactions that this account made. One is an application call. One is a transfer of USDC token. One is a transfer of algo. So you see that an account can make many kinds of different type of transaction. Application, that's how it looks like on the Explorer on Algorand. So it's defined by an application ID and some parameter. And you could also access uh, the code of the program. If you dig, dig, dig. Just for those who did the extra credit homework, don't get confused. What I'm talking about is not what you have seen at the, in the extra credit part of the homework. The extra credit part of the homework talks about contract account, smart signature, like negative logic. This is not the same as the smart contract. So just forget about the extra credit part of the homework if you did it. Completely independent. This talk. Actually, I will talk. I will come back at the end to this thing, but it's a more advanced topic. Okay. Good. Okay. So here we are. We said blockchain has two types of objects: account and smart contract. That's what we are. And now let's let's look actually a little bit more at what a blockchain is. So Tal, that's exactly still on the board. I told you blockchain like is a sequence of blocks. Each block contains transaction. And the full blockchain essentially is just this full list of blocks. And if you think about it, it's extremely large. Like on Ethereum, it takes nine terabytes, more than nine terabytes now. Even on Algon, which is a much more recent blockchain, it's already 900 gigabytes. So it's huge, huge amount. It's all the transactions since the inception. So it's often very convenient, instead of considering the full blockchain, all the transactions, to consider something which is much smaller, which is called the state of the blockchain. So it's just a, essentially the state of the blockchain is like some database representing um, the balances of all the accounts and the state of all the smart contracts. And it's much, much smaller than a full ledger. Because, um, and it can be computed from all the transactions. So let, let me show it to you on an example. So suppose that uh, uh, before, before a transaction, like currently, like yesterday, like uh, Alice at 20 algos, the, the token on Algorand, and Bob at seven algos. So the state of the blockchain would be this table where Alice has 20 algos, Bob has seven algos, and all the other accounts with their balances. So now suppose that uh, Alice sent two algos to Bob. For, to do that, she make a transaction. She signed it using her secret key. She put it in a block. And now, after this transaction, the state of the blockchain is updated. Like Alice now only have 18 algos and Bob has gets nine algos. Like I'm ignoring a lot of detail here, but that's, that's, that's sufficient for the purpose. So if you think about it, this, okay, this, this one is slightly annoying, but I'm not completely sure how to, if I can hide it more. Okay, hopefully this, this will be less annoying here. Uh, okay. Um, so if you think about it, the state size after this transaction hasn't even changed. We just updated two numbers in the state. Very small, very simple database. On the other end, the blockchain size increased. I added a transaction to the full list of transactions. So you see why the, the state of the blockchain can be much, much smaller. Like many transactions will not even increase the state of the blockchain. Some transactions do, but they are rarer. Like if you create an account, for example, obviously it will add a row in your table, but in general, it will not increase too much. So that's something that is 
good about it. So, that, so I will uh, need to use this notion of state of the blockchain quite often in the future. So it's, it's important that you understand what it took place. Yes. Okay, so each server or node, like we a node, so what we call a node is a server on the blockchain, is actually like processing all the transaction, and from this, this all this transaction, it uh, deduces the concept. So at the beginning, the state the state is defined by the genesis block, like it's defined in a certain way, like some account of a certain amount of token, and and then. If you run, like if you go over all the transactions from the beginning, you can update your state uh, slowly. And when you are like completely catch up, like when you arrive at the last transaction up to now, your state is the correct state of the blockchain. So that's how nodes or server maintain the state of the blockchain. And they all, all the nodes or server of the algorithm network or of any network is maintaining the state of the blockchain. Some server also keep the full blockchain. If, because sometimes it's useful, but not all of them because it's very large. Okay. Wait. Okay. So now we have some interesting issue. Okay. Good. Okay. So now that you know what the state of the blockchain is, let's see. Uh, our smart contracts work with regard, and uh, you remember that uh, what I the, one of the first thing I told you about is that a smart contract can read and write data on the blockchain, and actually they store it in the state of the blockchain. They read and write data in the state of the blockchain, and an algorithm, uh, more precisely, each application or smart contract, like on a gone we use the name application for smart contract, each application has access to what's called a global state for this application. And it consists of like a database of up to 64 key value. Uh, and each key and value is at most 128 bytes. So let's think of example of what you think you can do. You can, for example, in the global state of an application smart contract, store the number of yes, or what yes to a voting smart contract. So there is 120 people voting yes, 250 people voting no. Uh, like, and I can also store associated to the key admin, for example, the address or the account address that can administrate the smart contract and register voter or do this kind of thing that normal users should not be allowed to be doing. And if you look at how it's represented in the state of the blockchain, essentially in the state of the blockchain, you do one database table that associates to each application ID and each key a value. And each application ID has up to 64 keys. So if you think about it, 64 is quite small. You cannot, for example, store in this global state all the list of all voters because you can have thousands of voters. You cannot store all the list of all the votes because there can be thousands of votes. You can only store the tally. And but if you, what do you what happens if you want to still store the list of store the list of all voters or the list of all the votes? So for that on Algorand, you use what's called the local state. Yes. So each application has its own global state. Yes. Those are in terms yeah. of exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, more precisely in the case of local state, it's each application and as a local state per account that opt into the application. By opt in, I mean running a special transaction that says. I'm allowing you application to store data on my behalf in my on my behalf like associated to my account. And this is the local state. So each account that opt into the application, for each account that opt into the application, the application can store 16 additional key value associated to this account. So for example, the kind of thing you want to store there is if this account is a registered voter, is it allowed to vote? And once the account voted. The, what was the vote? Yes, no, or something else. And what's important to understand is that even if it's called local, it's still stored on the state of the blockchain. It's really still in the blockchain at the end of the day. And it's just like slightly different tables. So you have the global state table like this, and the local state table where it associates an account, an application ID, a key, and a value. 
And for each account application ID, you are allowed to have up to 16 rows of keys and associated value. Yes. So the reason why on Algorand you separate the local set and global set, and this is something specific to Algorand, is for performance right now, uh, because uh, you are not allowed to uh, act, you are only allowed to access the local set of a few accounts per transaction. So this way, when the server or the node process the transaction, they only need to check a few information in the state. Because even if the state is a small database, it's still costly to access it. It's actually even more costly to access it than doing normal computation. Like you can do a lot of computation for the cost of accessing your record in this database. So that's why you want to limit the kind of interaction. And I'll go on, it's limited this way. Uh, uh, on uh, Ethereum, you don't really have such limit, but you pay quite a lot, like you have a fee every time you access the state, essentially. So it's a bit of a different way of doing things. A very good question. So, good, good. So, access restriction. So, just to understand a bit more what's happening, if you're on application A, you can read and write your global state and the local state of all the accounts you want up to the limitation that you're only allowed to access for your, your, I don't remember the exact number, a certain number of accounts every time. But you can read, write whatever you want. And if you're on another application, you can only read. Uh, recall that everything on the blockchain is public. So you can always read, but you cannot write. And it's important to understand that even if the sender of the application code transaction, the, the person who makes the call to the smart contract is not you, the application can still access and write the local state for account you. So the application are really full power over that. And the opposite is true that even if you know the secret key of the account you, even if you are the owner of the account you, you cannot modify your local state. Like only the application has the right to modify the local state. So it's really something of the application, yeah. Um, the, the full state of the block, the, sta the state of the blockchain is a big database with several tables. I don't know if you did database or, uh, do you know what database, did you take a database class? Yeah, okay. So, so it's a big database with several tables and there are table for the balances <coughs> and table for the state of the application. And the table would look like this, this application ID would, as a, would have this key and this value and so on and so forth. And this is stored in the big in a big database, the state of the um, blockchain. And every node maintains the state of the blockchain. And if you read all the transaction from the beginning, if you take all the transaction of the blockchain from the beginning and you execute them, you, you will always end up and update your state accordingly to what the transaction do. You will always end up to the same state at the end, which is the current state of the blockchain. So for example, Suppose that at the beginning of time, like it's simpler to use the case with, a, with just a balance. At the beginning of time, Alice has 20 algos, Bob has seven algos, and I suppose that there is a single transaction in the blockchain. At the beginning of time, all the nodes store this state. And after one transaction, and I suppose it's a blockchain with a single transaction, then everybody agree on this state. And so every node has the same state database. And Yes, the global and the local state for each application is part of the big state of the database. It's part of these big states. Yes. 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 So, so that's where uh, if application B want to write to application A state, application B will actually make a call to application A. It will not write directly the state. You, are, you don't share memory, like uh, you call each other. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's actually a map, but just 64 key value. So it's actually a map, but just 64 key. So it's very limited compared to but uh, if you think about it, like 
you most you most of the time don't have an issue because you can easily map everything to local state. There is a little bit of trickery, but the truth is that there will be extended global states to soon on algo one two. Um, so So some slight more, slightly more detail. So to, up to now I said smart contract. On Algorand, there is no just one smart contract. A smart contract is two programs, an approved program and a clear program. Uh, we'll see just after why do we have two programs. And both of these programs access the same local state and global state. And this is something that is not at all specific to Algorand. This is something extremely important to understand. And many people get confused, I think the first time they do blockchain that there are always two parts in an application on the blockchain in the decentralized application there is a left part and the right part so the right part is a smart contract so it's written in a smart contract language in algorand it's called till if you write it in uh, ethereum it's solidity like on algorand you can also write it with a higher level language it's called PyTill, which is a python wrapper around till so you write some python code it compiles to till and that essentially is your smart contract this is part one, part the right part. Now, this part is completely independent to the left part. The left part is how do you interact with the smart contract? To interact with the smart contract, you need to issue transaction. And to generate this transaction, you don't use at all the same tool on the right. You use what uh, you call the SDK that you use in your homework. And you can write your application in Python, JavaScript, Go, Java, and things like this. And essentially, your application on the left side will communicate to some uh, blockchain node, blockchain server, to execute the transaction. The transaction might be de deploy the smart contract, call the smart contract, send a token to XYZ. And this is written in the SDK the same way you did it. So really completely independent. So even if you will be writing both sides in Python, this part use the SDK in Python, this part use Python and separate, they're not the same thing. Um, okay, <clears throat> little bit more detail here that is specific, a bit more specific to algorithms. There are multiple kinds of transactions that are related to our smart contract and algorithms. The basic one is a NOAP, it's a default call, and it's also used for creation if the application ID is zero. Then, because of this local storage, you have this opt-in transaction to allow the smart contract to allocate local storage in your account. The opposite of it is a closeout that uh, liberates, that try to freeze this local storage. Uh, the closeout can be rejected by the transaction. So for example, uh, by the smart contract, for example, the, at the end of a vote, you voted, you register at the end of the vote, it makes sense to close out. Nobody needs anymore to know who you voted to. You can close out and erase your uh, vote and you erase the fact that you're a registered voter. So the smart contract will say, yes, you can erase. But if you did not vote yet, for example, and you are registered, you should not be able to close out. Otherwise, you will lose the information that you are registered because it erased the fact that you are registered. So the close out is like a graceful way of deallocating your local storage but the smart contract can sometimes tell you don't do that it's a bad idea but sometimes you really want to bypass the smart contract and say okay i want to get rid of my local storage i don't care what you think and you use a clear program that you are called the clear point so that's up to you because i'm clear yes so the first five are the yes Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And the delete and update, it's exactly what we you think it is like delete the application or update the application. Okay. Okay. So what have we seen up to now? We have seen what the smart contract looks like. We have seen how the smart contract access the storage, like access some storage, like store some state. But we have not seen how the smart contract get money, how it get tokens. Like in the, remember in the crowdfunding program, you need people to send money token to the smart contract. How do you do that? And you need the smart contract to send token out. So on Algorand, the way it works, and it's kind of similar in other blockchain, but we see later in Ethereum, it's slightly different, is that a smart, a smart contract is actually associated 
so this is a smart contract like where you make transaction to deploy or create or call it so different user can deploy create and call and now the, what uh, the smart contract has is that it can control an application account so yeah the smart contract has control over an associated application account so the application account is like your basic account you created in your homework except it has no secret key so instead of to approve transaction like to issue transaction from an application account instead of signing the transaction with a secret key you just need a smart contract to issue some order like the smart contract can issue some order issue a transaction out of this application account that's how it works we'll see just in the next slide but the important thing in this slide is that the application account is just a normal account and so people uh, sorry and so the application account is as an algorand address like in any other account and remember that the smart contract has an application id that looks completely different and anybody can send token to the application account if they want the normal account now the interesting part is that the smart contract has control over this application account and it can issue what's called an inner transaction which says when the smart contract is executed so when an application call happen the smart contract executes some code and this code can decide to say issue <coughs> sorry issue this transaction out of my application account to this user and the smart contract does not need to sign or anything the, the fact that the smart contract says issue this it will issue the transaction out of the application account this specification account yes so yes so i think for real DeFi protocol like like the issue is that you can always have different kind of people defining differently, but something that is really hardcore DeFi, you cannot use the cold storage because the, the blockchain is no more in control over what's happening. The, the advantage of real hardcore DeFi is that code is low and the only thing that matters is what the blockchain thing and there should be no human interaction. If you add the cold storage, you will add human interaction. It's possible that this human will say, no, I'm not signing money out of it. So DeFi application may use multiple escrow accounts, but anyway, what's happening in general in the DeFi application is that the smart contracts control it. Like even if you have multiple application accounts, it changes nothing because if the smart contract has a bug, and as you have seen every week, you can find a new one that has a bug, uh, and there is a way to get money out of the application account in a way that is abusive. Like if I found a special application for accent that will give me money that I'm not entitled to, then I just siphon everything. And the fact that there is one application account in 10,000 change nothing because the smart contract has full control over it. So yeah, that's, that's the issue with DeFi that it happens quite often that there are bugs and money is siphoned out of the application account of the smart contract. And that's what it is. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, actually, I think maybe there is a plan. I'm not completely sure about like how to ensure higher level of security of smart contract using maybe formal verification and techniques that are more advanced than what currently exists sometimes uh, with regard to that. But this is very difficult. Okay. So now we have seen what a smart contract can do read and write data on the train. In Algorand, it's like this global and local states uh, notion. You can also read other information like the balances of accounts if you want. Receive token, just send them to the application account. Send token using inner transaction out of the application account. And something you don't need in this um, homework and just more advanced, but you can also call other smart contracts like in a very soon version in Algorand, but in general in blockchain, you can call other smart contracts. But there is one thing that is missing here. Okay, the smart contract can receive token in their application account, but how do they know that they receive the token? How do they know that they receive the token? That if tal sentinel goes to this application account, how does the smart contract know it's tal who sends the sentinel goes and not some random person? And to do that on Algorand, and here it's more specific to Algorand, 
we I need to introduce you a couple of uh, new notions. So let's start with the notion of algorand standard assets. So an algorand standard asset is really a custom token. So remember, all the blockchain have a native token. Bitcoin is Bitcoin, Ethereum is Ether, and so on and so forth. And this native token is used at some level for the consensus protocol, as a, in general for rewards or in proof of stake for if you will see what, for what reason proof of stake, but it doesn't matter. This is really the native token of the blockchain. But sometimes having just a token is not very nice. I mean, you, it, I mean, it's nice, but you want to do more. And most modern blockchain supports you to create custom token. And usually anyone can create their custom token. An example of custom token you want to create, if you are a shop and you have a loyalty program, you want to create a custom token for the loyalty program. So every time you buy $10 at the shop, you get 10 points, which is a special token on, on the blockchain. And then later you can redeem this point inside the shop. And you don't want to use algos or Ether or Bitcoin for that because like one day the person can have $10 in Bitcoin, the next day $100,000 and then the next day $1. So you don't want that. And in addition, you want to force the person to redeem their point in your shop. You don't want them to shop to a concurrent shop. So, so that's a good reason to use a custom token and not the native token. Another example is a stable coin. I don't, Tal will talk a lot about them, but here you just think about something that represents a dollar because you don't want too much variability in the volatility, too much volatility in your token. So stable coin are custom tokens that represent a dollar, for example, USDT. Okay. So on algorithm specific, so that is, is something very common, like it's not specific to algorithm. What is algorithm specific is that essentially, Custom tokens that are called ASA are similar to the basic native token. Like they cost the same fee to transact, same type of transaction essentially. Like everything is very similar to a normal token. And in uh, Ethereum, you also have this notion of uh, custom token, but this ERC20, ERC721, ERC1155, if you have heard of them. But there is a bit of a difference that smart uh, that tokens are actually smart contracts. And it has advantages or disadvantages. One disadvantage is that it's, um, it has higher fees and it's slightly more complex to do. Advantages is maybe that you have slightly more flexibility. So, but um, yeah, so here it is. Anyway, you have this uh, custom token. And one thing you may want to do when you have custom token is to do exchange with friends. So Alice want to exchange uh, algos with USDC with Bob. So Alice want to send one algo, Bob wants to send back 20 USDC. So it's a very uh, bright future and um, and uh, they want to do it in such a way that nobody gets cheated on. So if Alice sent first one algo, maybe Bob will not send back the 20 USD. And if Bob sent back the 20 USDC to Alice, uh, sends first the 20 USDC to Alice, Bob, uh, Alice may not send back the one algo. So there is an issue there, like they cannot be sure that uh, things, the deal will be executed properly. And what algorithm allows you to do is to use what's called atomic transfer or group transaction. So you can group atomically these two things, these two transactions, so that all the transactions succeed or none of them succeed. So that it's not possible that one of them gets the token without having to send the other token. So we either they both send the token together or nothing happens. So that's the magic of the atomic transfer or group transaction. And note that it's not at all limited to two transactions and it's not at all limited to um, transfer of value. It can also be just smart contract code. And that, yes. Oh, no, it's uh, 16 is uh, just a power of two, so it's a nice number. It needs to be small because you don't want to have to roll back 10,000 transactions at once. Because if you have 10,000 transactions and one fail in the middle of the 10,000, then you spend a lot of time evaluating 10,000 transactions and roll back a lot. So you need a small number. And I think all these numbers are arbitrary. So it could be 32, but it has been decided 16. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the way now you use this atomic transfer to make a smart contract aware that you paid the application account is to, instead of paying the application account and say, hello, I paid you, you group them together and you pay and 
in the same group of transactions, the same atomic transfer, you call the smart contract. And an algorithm, the smart contract is allowed to inspect any transaction in this group. So the smart contract, when it's called, can check, oh, I have been called together with a payment to my application account. Um, that's important because in general on algorithm, but in general in also blockchain, smart contracts are a bit limited on what they can do. Not only they can, so we have seen at the beginning that smart contract cannot see things outside of the blockchain. That smart contract lives on the blockchain. They don't know the outside world. They have never been outside of the blockchain. But even worse than that, usually for performance reason, you don't want a smart contract to be able to inspect the second transaction of the blockchain 10, 10 years ago. Because this means that smart contract can only be executed on nodes that store the full blockchain on Ethereum is nine terabytes. So like the only node that can ever actually execute smart contract on Ethereum would be node with terabytes of SSD, good luck. So instead you put some restrictions for performance and usually you say, one of the restrictions is that you cannot essentially inspect other transactions to, to do things simply. And on the ground, you have this exception that if you group transactions together, the smart contract can inspect the other transactions in the group. And that's how you ensure that the smart contract knows that it was paid. Okay, let's see all what we have seen on a simple example of crowdfunding. So crowdfunding, I talked a little bit about it, but if you have heard of Kickstarter, I think many of people have heard of Kickstarter. It's like the Kickstarter, but decentralized. So Kickstarter is the place you put your project, you say, I need $10,000. I want it by the end of March. And if I get 10, if people are generous enough, give me 